hello, hello. This is Ashley with Ashley Says So. And first off, I want to say thank you so much to my handsome male fans and my beautiful female fans. You guys have been liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting, and I really appreciate that. So thank you for that. I'm back today with another video on Otis Redding and Lola Falana. I had to combine them together because, like I said before, there just was not enough tea to do one video a piece. So let's get to it. Old Hollywood Scandals, Otis Redding and Lola Falana. Otis Redding was born September 9th, 1941 in Dawson, Georgia. He was the fourth of six children and the first son that was born to Mr. Otis Redding Sr. and Mrs. Fanny Roseman. At an early age, Otis started singing at the Vineville Baptist Church and that's where he learned guitar and piano. And at the age of 10, he started to take drum and singing lessons. When he attended Ballard Hudson High School, he sang in the school band. And also every Sunday, he earned $6 for performing gospel songs at the radio station WIBB. And this is around the time that he started to cite Sam Cooke and Little Richard as his musical influences. And can't you tell? I sure can. I mean, their voices were not really the same, but the same melody, same tune they kind of had. You know, I hope y'all know what I'm talking about. At the age of 15, Otis actually left school because he had to take care of his family. His father had contracted tuberculosis and he was often in the hospital. He became the family's primary income earner. And in order to earn money, he started working as a well digger, a gas station attendant, and he performed music, but he did not do that much. It was the other two that he was doing very heavily at that time. Now, Otis's big moment came in 1958 when he was in a talent show called The Teenage Party. Johnny Jenkins, a local but prominent guitarist, was in the audience and he heard Otis. And although he thought Otis sounded good, he thought his band sounded a mess. Otis had probably put together a little rad tag team child. Them folks ain't know what they was doing. Up there just beating on the drum and playing music. They know what was going on. So Johnny actually got on stage and played for Otis. And Otis got up there and he sang Little Richard's song, Heebie Jeebies, and he won the contest. Not only that one time, he won the contest 15 weeks in a row. And he got a cash prize of $5. After this, Otis had a little clout going on, honey. And he was soon invited to replace the front man of a group called Patty Cake, Patty Cake, of course, and the Mighty Panthers. Now, these were two little good groups and Otis was doing well. But child, soon he got a call from the upsetters telling him that little Richard had left them and went on about his way doing solo. Baby, Otis ran, honey, ran to be the front man of the upsetters. Now, this is when a little bit more real cash started coming in. And when I say real cash, I mean about $25 a gig. But shoot, that's about 200 and some dollars today. That was pretty good money back then, especially for a little unknown singer from the South. Right now, some of you may have noticed that the sound in the beginning of the video and now is different. I tried to record in my regular room, child, and the fire alarm thing fell off, bust me upside the head, child. I had to get out of there. I couldn't, uh-uh, I couldn't do it. Now, it was around this time that Otis, who was 18 years old, had met his future wife, Miss Zelma Atwood, and she was only 15 years old. They actually met at one of those contests at the teenage party. But child, they was doing a little bit too much partying, honey, because soon after they met, Otis got Miss Zelma pregnant. And they had a son named Dexter, who was born in the summer of 1960. But marriage was not that far away because that next year in 1961 in August, they were married. And honey, after they got married, they got busy. And then they had Demetria, Carla, and then lastly, they had Otis Redding III. Now, child, in between all that huffing and puffing and pumping and stroking and whatever else was going on, Otis did find time to move to Los Angeles with his sister, Denise. And he left Zelma and the child behind because he had not established himself yet. You know, he ain't really made no money at this time, so he left them where they were. But it wasn't until 1962 when they sent Otis down to Memphis, Tennessee to get on the Stax record label that he really started to make some noise, really started to shine. And that's because they started to mold him. Because when he got down there, he was trying to sing like Little Richard. Like, you're trying to do too much, Little. we got Little Richard already, we don't need all that. So what are you doing, Otis? So they molded him into sounding more like himself. And when he did that, they released these arms of mine. These arms of mine, they are longing, yes. And baby, 
it was pretty much over with. They knew that he was going to shoot for the stars. And a little bit later on, he did. So now, like I said, Otis is getting a little bit successful. He's starting to tour all around. And child, this is when a little bit of infidelity started entering the picture. Let's go ahead and get to the tea, honey. So supposedly he was performing somewhere. I'm not sure. I think it was down south somewhere. And a Miss Betty Levette, who was a small time singer at that time. She was actually trying to break into the biz herself. Um, she came down and she was touring and she actually sang on the same bill that Otis was singing on. And after the show, Otis stalked his big frame over to her. She did in her book talk about, you know, how handsome he was. He was a big, tall, fine, dark-skinned man, and he was. And so Betty LeVette was enthralled by him and supposedly he was enthralled by her. Started flirting with her, you know, they're talking about singing. They're flirting with each other pretty much. And by the end of the night, they had slept together. After it was over, Betty says that Otis actually asked for her hand in marriage. You know, he wanted to marry her. And she said that she was the one that said, no, you know, you got a little girl pregnant at home, little girlfriend waiting for you. Like, I'm not about to snatch her man like that. Like, don't do that, because if I wanted to, I could snatch you from her, but I'm not even finna do that. So, you know, props to Miss Betty LeVette. But what's funny is that Betty LeVette is the same person that I mentioned on the Aretha Franklin video that had slept with Ted White. Just sleeping with everybody, man. Betty, you ought to be shaming yourself. You, you, you do it too much. You done too much, Betty. So the years are passing and Otis is actually recording some pretty big hits. You know, he had These Arms of Mine. He had Try a Little Tenderness. He had I've Been Loving You Too Long, um, Love Man. You know, just a slew of songs. Some may be big time, some may be small time, but to me, they're all good. And it is said that Otis credited a lot of his success to his wife because he said a lot of the songs that he wrote were about his wife. They had a very, you know, explosive type of relationship. Their love was very passionate. They loved each other. She did say that Otis was a bit controlling. And that's kind of weird because if he was out here cheating and doing everything else, you're worried about what your wife doing, but you're not worried about what you're doing. So, you know, but I also heard that she was a little bit controlling. You know, they both had their eyes on each other, scared that the other one was cheating, you know, and doing their own thing. So it was a passionate affair, but they were very young. You have to remember when he passed away, he was only in his 20s. So around this time, they're what? Both, she's probably like 20, 21, and he's probably like 24 or something like that. So there is very, very a heated exchange between the both of them. But they did say that they were very much in love. Then 1967 hits and some more infidelity rears its ugly head. Somebody at Stax Records had the bright idea to do a King and Queen album. Basically saying the King and Queen of Stax Records. And of course, Otis Redding was the King because he carried that music label. And the Queen was Miss Carla Thomas. Yeah. Now, Miss Carla was a student at Howard University and she was actually working on her degree. And she also was the daughter of label mate, Mr. Rufus Thomas. And Rufus Thomas had actually been the first recording artist at Stax. You know, Rufus over there, you know, Pat Otis on the shoulder, you know, you doing good, man, yeah. The whole time Otis sitting up there messing with Carla, the daughter. Now, I don't know if they had been messing around for the years up until this point, because you gotta remember, Otis had been with the label since 1962. It is now 1967. So I don't know if they had been messing around or what, but I know for sure that around this time they were actually messing around. There's also a rumor out there that they have a child together. I kind of don't believe it, honestly, but they did say that Otis Redding and Carla Thomas may have a child together. So if you know, let me know. And also at this time, Otis Redding is living the life. You know, he's a very wealthy man. In 1967, had he lived all the way through, he made $1 million alone in that year. He paid about $125,000 for a farm, a ranch for his family, his wife and children. It was called the Big O Ranch. I also heard that he bought his in-laws a big ranch, his mother-in-law and his father-in-law. He had them sitting on the ranch as well. He owned all of his stuff. It was all named Otis Redding Enterprises. So he was making all this money from all the record sales, concerts, everything he did, he made money on. He made sure he owned everything he did. Very smart businessman. I watched some documentaries and things on him and they try to act like, you know, he was slow and he was, but he wasn't slow. He was just country. 
you know, some folks just be country and they seem a little bit slower to Northern people or city people. Now let's talk about when Otis started to explode worldwide. He performed at the Monterey Festival. And when he performed there, he was doing a crossover because mainly only black people really knew about Otis Redding. Let's just be honest. White people didn't really know anything about him. But at the Monterey Festival, he was able to cross over to pop and rock audiences. And to be honest, they didn't know how the audience was going to act. But luckily, the audience loved it. They didn't want him to leave the stage. Now they wanted more. So he really was a big success. His name overnight shot up to the sky. It was big time for Mr. Otis Redding. In early December, Otis Redding started to record his last known song, and that was Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. And if you listen closely to the end of that song, there's a whistle at the end. Um, doo -doo, doo -doo -doo. I, I can't do the whistle like him. That was actually supposed to be words, like a little rap that he was going to do at the end. Um, and he couldn't think of anything at that moment in the studio. And he said, well, just save it like it is. When I get back from my concert, I'll fill the words in then. On December the 9th, Otis and his band appeared on a television show called Upbeat, which was shot in Cleveland. After the show, he made time for his wife and children, of course, and he gave them a phone call, checked in with them, and let them know that his next performance was going to be in Madison, Wisconsin. Now, his wife said on this phone call, she felt like something wasn't right. There was something that made her uneasy. It was just something different about this phone call, but she didn't say anything. She held her peace and she said goodbye to her husband, wished him luck and wished him on his way. The next day did come, that was December the 10th and Otis, I feel like made a terrible decision but if you believe in fate, maybe he was supposed to make that decision. Otis was warned that he should not fly in these conditions. You know, there was heavy rain and fog but Otis being the man that he was, he was a businessman, first of all. Then he was a star. You know, he was a showman. He did not want to let his fans down. If he told him he was going to be there, he was going to be there. So he did make the decision to go ahead and fly in those horrible conditions. Not only him, but it was him and his band, the Barcase, that got on the plane with him. They took off and about four miles from their destination, which was Truex Field in Wisconsin, the plane went down into Lake Monona. And when it crashed, it took the lives of Mr. Otis Redding and four members of the Barcade. Fallon Jones, Ronnie Caldwell, Jimmy King, and Carl Cunningham. Also their valet, Matthew Kelly, and pilot Richard Frazier perished in the crash as well. There was one survivor of the crash, and that was Mr. Ben Cauley. He was a member of the Barcase. He said that he remembered everybody being asleep on the plane. And then he heard some commotions that made him open his eyes. And that's when he heard Mr. Fallon Jones, a bandmate of his, scream, oh no, while he was looking out the window. Ben says that's when he started unbuckling his seatbelt and then boom, they hit the water. He said when he woke up, he was clinging to a seat cushion, but he couldn't see anybody else. He started hearing screams for help. He said he never heard Otis, but he was hearing others scream for help and nobody came. And he said slowly their screams started dying down because they started freezing to death. The next day was a sad, sad affair. That is when it was reported that the plane had crashed and Otis Redding's body was actually recovered. And they found out that he never even unbuckled his seatbelt or exited the plane. Actually, they don't even know if he even woke up. He could have still been asleep when the plane crashed into the water. So, you know, his death may have been instant. That's the only thing that we can hope for. Otis's funeral was a few days later on December the 18th at the Auditorium of Macon. Otis's wife made sure that her husband's remains were buried on their property at the Big O Ranch so he can be out there with her forever. And I also want to touch back a little bit on this infidelity. They said that Otis's wife, she don't want to hear nothing about the infidelity. She doesn't believe it, which I guess that's okay for a wife to do. You know, I understand. Nobody wants to hear the worst about their husband. But child, they said that she will really cuss you out. Like she will really get in your tail when you sit up there and try to act like that he was less than perfect. You know, so, I, hey, I don't know. But y'all go on, go on over there and try to tell Miss Zelma that and watch her cuss you out. Come back and tell me about it so I can laugh. So that was the not so scandalous, but very tragic tale of Mr. Otis Redding. And I guess we should be glad that it's not that scandalous because he didn't really live that long. So it would be crazy if he had a life full of scandal. 
So let's go ahead and get into Miss Lola Falana. Lolita Elaine Falana was born on September the 11th, 1942 in Camden, New Jersey. She was the third of six children born to Bennett, a welder, and Cleo Falana, who was a seamstress. By the age of three, Lola was dancing, and by the age of five, she was singing in the church choir. By the time she was in junior high school, she was already dancing in nightclubs and getting her groove on, but her mother would escort her there just in case there was some funny business going on. Lola got her first big dancing gig in 1958, and that is when she danced as an opening act to Miss Dinah Washington when she appeared in a nightclub in Philadelphia. Now, her mother and father supported her, you know, doing her dancing and things like that, but not really, because that was cool to do on the side. If you make it, you make it, but they still wanted her to go to college and get a college degree. But Lola was hell bent on becoming a performer. She didn't even want to get a backup. It was either she was going to be a performer or she was not going to be anything. So against her parents' wishes, she dropped out of Germantown High School and she certainly wasn't about to attend college. After doing this and disappointing her parents, she moved to New York City. Now let's insert a little bit of tea here, honey. So Lola is dancing for Dinah. She's doing openings, you know, they're getting close. And if you know Dinah Washington, she was a very sexual and sensual person. Um, She pretty much slept with who she wanted to, when she wanted to, and she's gonna be on one of these videos very, very soon, sweetheart, best believe. So supposedly Dinah is with one of her lovers and she invited Miss Lola Falana to the bedroom with them and Lola accepted. Supposedly Dinah Washington had a fascination with feet or toes or something like that and she was trying to show out for her lover, honey. So she went down on Lola and she started biting at her feet and her ankles and bit too hard, child and said Lola started screaming and everything, cussing and everything. I know I would have been, what are you doing down there? You doing, get, get your tail up, biting and stuff. About to bite my ankle off. Get up. Now Lola is in New York and things are going well, but she hasn't had much big success in New York. So she joins a chorus line in Atlantic City, New Jersey. While dancing in Atlantic City, Lola was discovered by none other than Mr. Sammy Davis Jr. And he loved the way she danced and he loved the way she sang and he invited her to dance for his Broadway show. And this was in 1964, and she wasn't just like one of the dancers on the stage, no ma'am. She had a featured role on his show. Now in 1966, Sammy Davis Jr. cast Lola in something that would be her first film role, and it was for A Man Called Adam. And it was because of her performance in this movie that she became a major star in Italian cinema. As a matter of fact, they started calling her the Black Venus. Ooh, go on then, Lola, with your bad self. We see you, sis. Now, while she's in Italy, she's doing a lot more touring with Sammy Davis Jr. And they started an affair, but this was a problem because Sammy Davis Jr. was married to Miss My Brit. And he also was carrying on another affair with an actress named Altavis Gore. Now this affair did some damage because it became public. Somebody found out about it, told everybody else, and Sammy's wife, my Brit, actually divorced him because of this. Somebody even had a tale that Sammy Davis Jr. was playing his cards so well that one day Lola Falana came to his home and Altavis was actually upstairs and Lola was downstairs. Supposedly, he had his way with both of them without the other one knowing that the other one was there. So homeboy was a player or something because that's just crazy. Lola claims that in 1969, she ended her affair with Sammy Davis Jr. because she said basically it was kind of impeding everything that she wanted to achieve. She didn't want to be known as just Sammy Davis Jr.'s little dancer that dances around stage. And so she wanted to make more of herself. But some people would say that that's a lie, that she didn't break off anything. And if she did, she broke it off because Sammy Davis Jr. chose to marry Altavis Gore instead of marrying her. And him and Altavis did get married that next year in 1970. So who knows what the truth is? And word on the street also said this is why Lola ended up marrying Mr. Butch Tavares, who sang with the musical group named Tavares in 1970, because Sammy Davis Jr. chose Altavis. She made her first American film in the year of 1970 as well, which was The Liberation of L.B. Jones. Now, 
Some people say even a commenter on one of my videos have said that this movie was looked at more as like a softcore porn video because it was something basically about this black married couple, the wife starts sleeping with white man, kind of becoming a concubine. And of course the wife is played by Miss Lola Falana. So something about showing him too much Southern hospitality or something like that. I don't know. I tried to describe that movie the best way I could, but I have not seen the movie. Some people said that the movie was like a terrible movie, that it was not worth anybody seeing. But it must have been worth something because Miss Lola Falana was nominated for a Golden Globe Award for New Star of the Year in the Actress Division. So this movie hyped up her profile a little bit because it was also this year that she posed for Playboy. And she was the first black woman to model for the Fabergé Tigress perfume ad. In 1971, she started doing appearances on the Joy Bishop Show and the Hollywood Palace. These appearances led to Bill Cosby hiring her on his new show, The New Bill Cosby Show, which made its debut on September the 11th, 1972, which just so happened to be Lola's 30th birthday. Now, Bill Cosby had actually met Lola way earlier, back when he was in college, and she was 14. She was, she was a struggling dancer and only making about $10 a show when she was dancing back in Philadelphia. Throughout the mid-70s, Lola Star was shining. She appeared on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, The Muppet Show, The Flip Wilson Show, The Last in and probably many other shows the girl was doing her thing but her marriage to butch Tavares was suffering because apparently they couldn't stop cheating on each other butch was at himself that no he never slowed down like he was entertaining ladies before and after he said there was no pause no break no nothing he kept it going but that's just one source that says that they were cheating on each other there was another source that said that Lola was actually faithful and it was Butch that kept on doing all of the cheating and she would beg him to stop. But people started whispering and magazines started doing a little gossiping that Butch is out here doing Lola any kind of way. And that is when Lola made the decision to say that they were in a open relationship to save her ego, save her pride. Pretty much put it like, well, you know, child, we both doing this to each other. Like he ain't just cheating on me. I'm getting mine too. So don't do me, sir. But with all this mess going on, their marriage could not last for long. So in 1975, they actually called it quits and divorced. And I think this is around the time, or maybe even before, that Lola caused a big stir in the African-American community because she got on some kind of show and basically made it clear that she was not black. Like she was Latina, you know, Cuban, things like that. And the thing is though, she was telling the truth. She was not fully black. She was like an Afro-Latina, Cuban type of woman. That was her background. Her dad had that type of background. So she actually was telling the truth. But child, y'all know black folks wasn't buying that. Black folks say, you got the black skin color, you black. That just is what it is. But she wasn't worried too much about that because she was able to bring her stage shows to Las Vegas. And there she became became a smash hit. She was a big success. Even though she supposedly wasn't still messing around with Sammy Davis Jr. at this time, he did help her get that show on the road. In the late 1970s, Lola Falana became the queen of Las Vegas. She was making $100,000 per week. That's a lot of doggone money. Are you sitting up here doing 52 week shows, stuff like that? Child, 100,000 times 52, $520,000? I bet I take it. She did try to parlay her stage act in Las Vegas over to television to become a serious actress. And she did get cast on a show called Capital, but the show did not do well and it was canceled pretty, pretty early on. Now Lola worked her Vegas shows as well as shows other places all the way up until 1987. And that is when she suffered with multiple sclerosis. And it was really bad. Her left side became paralyzed. She became partially blind. She could not really hear well. Even her voice became impaired. She had to spend a year and a half in recovery, just basically getting her body to function the way it used to, getting her mobility back. She said that the only thing that helped her through this whole process 
was her faith, was the Lord. She said she prayed constantly, 24-7. After she recovered, she did do some shows in Las Vegas again, but her main focus became her faith. And when she suffered another relapse of multiple sclerosis in 1996, she basically retired from show business for good to focus on her health and her faith. Now, here's a little bit of tea to add to y'all's pot. It is also said that she may have slept with Mr. Frank Sinatra. Maybe she slept with Sammy Davis Jr. You know, why not go through the Rat Pack to see who can get you where? And Frank Sinatra would have been the leader of that Rat Pack. So if she would have harped on him, maybe he could have advanced her career. I don't know. So there's that bit of tea. And now we are at the end of this full video. That is the not so scandalous tale once again of Miss Lola Falana. I told y'all there was not much here for these two people, but I did want to get a video out to you guys because you guys requested it. So who are we doing next guys? Miss Josephine Baker or Miss Billie Holiday? Let me know in the comments who's next. Um, of course, I'll still end up doing the other person. They just won't be next. So let me know, put your vote down there. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure you click like, subscribe, share, and bye.